Hello and welcome to the SAS Ops Show. My name is Justine, joined by my colleague Brian and our very own Blair Sammons from our Enterprise Solutions team. <laughs> Today we'll be chatting Hi. about different ways of rolling out identity as a service, also known as IDAS, and potential pitfalls you might fall into. Blair, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you give our viewers a brief introduction so they can get to know you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Blair here. Uh, I am on the solutions engineering or pre-sales engineering team here at Better Cloud. Um, but my background's not in sales. It's actually in IT. So I spent the last uh, 15 plus years working my way up the, the ranks, starting as an Apple genius all the way through IT director, lead of corporate engineering, IT management, consultant, MSP, in-house, all of it. Um, so I have really unique perspective on kind of the, the pain points we all feel in SaaS. Um, and then obviously I've now joined the dark side, now joined the dark side, now joined the dark side, and, and, and have good uh, insights into SaaS ops and, you know, what Better Cloud is like on this side of the fence. I bought Better Cloud in my last environment, so really um, unique experience there. You just gave me like whiplash just from hearing about all of the jobs you had. IT man, you got to shift those gears real quick. <laughs> Any fun facts you want to share? Um, I'm into keyboards, so I got way more keyboards than computers at this point. Uh, really into Legos, which you can see here. I, this is not all of them, but I've got like a thousand Lego sets, give or take. Um, oh, yeah. I see. You have you have children, right? Oh, these are mine. <laughs> no, <laughs> these, yeah, these are for me. There you go. I got the Lego Lego tattoo. Yes, I do have children. These are dads. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's special Legos. What's the what's the coolest thing you've built with your Legos? Um, I don't know if you guys have seen, not the really big Millennium Falcon that just came out, but like the smaller cool one. I went through and built one a couple years ago with just like random colors. Because here, let me move my camera. I've got tons and tons of colors to choose from. Oh my God. So I just went through and built so like a rainbow Millennium Falcon. It was pretty rad. It took forever. So you just built a freeform? No, no, I like got the instructions okay. and then just built it with random pieces. So it wasn't like all gray and cool looking. It was just, you know, rainbowed out. It was very, uh, very pride friendly. That's um, awesome. You have to send us a picture of that. Yeah, I'll yeah. have to dig it up and find it. I also have a Lego coffee table in my front, uh, front house or front uh, room. Front house. Yeah, in the front house, you know, <laughs> in my, front of in my, my house. side house. <laughs> house number three. It's, he's doing really well, I guess. Yeah, better cloud. It's a great, great company. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's dive right in. Um, so first, I wanted to talk about what even the heck is an IDAS, and why would a company want to utilize one in their stack? Blair, can you walk us through it? So IDAS, which is going to be Identity as a Service, right? It might be called IDP, right? Identity Provider, IAM. There are a bunch of different names for these different things. Um, but they all kind of fall in that same bucket of really a directory of your users in the cloud um, and then predominantly then called upon by other cloud apps, right? There's obviously an on-prem uh, solution for most of them, but predominantly in the cloud and SaaS and, and whatnot. Um, and the biggest reason is a single source of truth, right? That is by far and away the biggest pain point um, that IT folks have when initially going to SaaS, right? Who is a user? Who's not a user? Who's in my environment? Who's not? Um, I know when I went through this experience through one of my um, previous roles, we had mm, about 1,200 users. I found a team of 40 Russian contractors that nobody knew who they were, but they were getting paid and they had full access into our environment, but we couldn't find out who they worked for. Yeah, it was super sketchy, right? And it was like, oh, well, so-and-so hired them for, you know, then, and then they got fired and nobody, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, this is a problem, right? So... IDAS kind of, you know, solves this source of truth point and then further, you know, it just kind of stair steps down from there. You got single sign-on and MFA and all the security features that comes with provisioning into other accounts, uh, yada, yada, so on and so forth. So you're saying that uh, an IDAS is the thing that's going to stop me from continuing to getting paid for like years after I've left a job? Maybe. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> so there's really two main schools of thought on how you would roll something like this out. One would be ripping off the band-aid, doing it all at once. And the other one would be doing a more phased approach over a period of time. Um, in a perfect world, what do you think makes the most sense? Like, how would you want to do it? I've, I've done it a couple different ways. My favorite is doing it all at once. And what, what I'm, I mean by that is all of the apps, all of the users, all of the groups, all of it, right? You rip that bandaid off and become fully SSO or MFA or, you know, IDAS, whatever you want to call it, 
go all in all at once. Um, and the way I've really handled that in the past has been through training sessions, right? Mm -hmm. Mandatory training sessions, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, typically I would empower like the director or manager or whoever over a particular team. Um, and then either let them train their, their folks or then they are the ones responsible. Basically they're the ones responsible to get those folks trained, whether they come to the training session provided by IT, they handle it themselves if they're tech savvy, whatnot. Um, and then there is a end date of this is when the bandaid is getting ripped off going from this point forward. You will not be able to access it, um, you know, via other than SAML or other than SSO or what have you. That's why I like to do it personally. You know, I think it's funny. You, you described it like in a perfect world um, or like with infinite resources. And I do think that that sounds great, but I think a lot of times there are some limitations on resources. So for us, I know, um, you know, I mean, it's, we don't have a huge IT team. It's a few of us. So going through the process of uh, setting up an, um, an IDP and, and SAML apps uh, for better cloud was a little bit more phased than that. Now we did, um, we did kind of rip the bandaid off in terms of getting every user on at the same time. So we sent a lot of emails and a lot of communication saying like, Hey, on this date, we are going to enable, we're going to give you access to Okta. And what is an Okta and what does that even mean? And why do you care? And we came up with a list of I think it was maybe like 12 or so core applications that were both easy to implement from a time and effort perspective, like very early on, and would also be helpful and, and things that we thought would actually get people to start using the system. And we did those 12 or so apps um, all at once. And we had a cutoff date. And then from that point on, we kind of, we identified groups of apps um, that people would need access to. And we kind of said, okay, like week one, we're doing these apps like on this Friday, um, all of them are gonna cut over. And then week two, we're doing another couple of apps, week three. And so we did draw it out a lot more, um, which, you know, I don't necessarily think that I want to be like continuously rolling applications into an IDP for like over the course of an entire year. But at the same time, I think it, it worked pretty well in our case because we just didn't have so much time or resources to devote to that. Um, and it was really funny to see what applications it would actually get someone to start using um, Okta. Like we went, I think six months and I got, you know, the, the number of people who had never signed in dropped and dropped and dropped. And then at the very end, it was like, yeah, so like I've never even signed in before. Like, can you send me a reset password or a password reset? And I was like, well, we've put G Suite and Salesforce and Slack and all of these other apps behind, uh, behind Okta. So I'm really just not sure how you have been getting through this. What is it time. you say you like, do here? <laughs> what would you say you do here? Do you log into anything? Like how have you gotten your email? Um, so, I mean, I do think for us, uh, we're, at the time, I think we were about a 200 person company. Um, I would, I would probably rip off the bandaid in the sense of getting every user in at once, but, um, maybe not every application in at once. Blair, I know that you used one login at a previous company. Um, can you tell us about the experience using that and what you would have done differently if you did it again? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been fortunate that I've gotten to use both actually one login, Okta, jump cloud, Google SSO, ADF, right? I've had a, a broad range of experience there, but one login is by far and away my personal favorite for a myriad of reasons. Um, one of the biggest reasons, I'm a Mac guy, I love Apple, Apple certs, blah, blah, blah. Um, they play real nice in the Apple space, um, especially when you start talking about zero touch deployment, you know, through Jam for whatever MDM you're using. Um, so we had, uh, we were going through setting up zero touch deployment at the same time as rolling out one login desktop. Um, which is the MFA for, you know, single sign-on for your desktop via one login. But we rolled out the one, zero touch bef just before we rolled out the one log login desktop. And we ended up having to go back and like migrate user accounts and do some magic to get it to, to fully work. Whereas if we had done those at the same time, um, it just would have been done. And our users would have just signed in and everything would have been great and hunky-dory. Um, so I would have, you know, even though, you know, initially we pushed those two, it, two projects uh, separately, they should have been the same and it would have been 
more work as far as like an individual project is concerned, but it would have netted out way less work overall um, because it would have been done the right time from the beginning. Yeah, gotcha. That totally makes sense. Um, speaking of gotchas. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, what are some gotchas that you might run into in configuring SAML for something like G Suite or Office 365? So, I mean, one thing is when you are planning each application, you need to know which ones will lock everyone out of the application if you haven't set it up properly, if you haven't assigned it to them um, ahead of time. And that varies all the way from like, you can set a policy for every single individual user if you want, you can exclude certain groups from single sign-on if you want, all the way to, um, nope, once you press the switch, everyone's in, and if they're not in, they're locked out. You shall not pass! You should know that the big ones, like G Suite and Office 365, are both pretty much, uh, what, do they, what do they call them, big bang apps. Like, you have to turn them on for pretty much everyone. Um, in the case of G Suite, the only way that you can exclude people from signing in is um, via net masks. So if you have discrete network segments, you can say um, this office will be excluded from single sign-on while we roll it out in this other office. Um, but you can't do it on a user by user basis or an Or OU you could or upgrade everyone basis. to super admin. <laughs> There's that. The other gotcha is that super admins will never go through SSO. They'll always bypass it. And so you have to also be aware that when you disable, let's say you're running G Suite and you've got two-factor authentication turned on for everybody, and now you've turned it off because you are using the MFA provided by your identity provider, your super admins don't go through that identity provider and they still need to have MFA in G Suite turned on or in Office 365. So um, you gotta be aware like what the security implications will be of switching your MFA provider from one to the other. And then in the case of Office, SSO applies to everyone within your federated domain. So for us, bettercloud.com, everybody with the bettercloud.com email um, is included and can't be excluded from SSO. But anyone that's on the, the default on microsoft.com domain, those are excluded. So when you're going through that side, you have to know that, okay, all of my service accounts that I have, I need to move them to that on Microsoft domain, or I need to come up with the solution that allows them to bypass um, MFA or something like that for as soon when they're federated. Great use case um, that for was, service accounts. Like if you, you know, all the service accounts should be the admins and then our normal user accounts should go through SSO and be normal user accounts. Yeah, and, and, and also in that, exactly to that point though, like you don't always want every service account to be a, a super admin or an admin in, in that application. So you have to be aware of like which service accounts are super admins and this won't matter to them and which ones are regular users and, and you will have to come up with um, some additional um, rules or ways to handle that. The other thing that happened, um, happened specifically with Office 365 that I got told about, but it was very like, it's a very like a, an asterisk of a footnote of whatever is that if you're coming, if you're moving my, uh, users from uh, regular Office 365 sign in to sign in through an identity provider, um, I know this applies to Okta. I don't know if it applies to everybody, but at least specifically for Okta, if you never had um, Active Directory on prem before, your users need to have a profile attribute called an immutable ID. That ID is just a like a random string um, of a certain length filled out in their profile before you they'll be able to sign in via Okta. No part of the setup process really explains that explicitly. No part of the setup process really explains that explicitly and Okta won't set those for you. an enterprise solution like Microsoft you actually can't even set them in the user interface either. You have to, in our case, we ended up using um, a PowerShell script to go through and just like generate random immutable IDs for people. So that was a fun thing to discover at, I don't know, like 10.30 PM when we were trying to get somebody to sign in for the first time. Exciting when that happens. This is kind of random, you know, on the whole gotcha thing and something I ran into is, you know, when you switch over to SAML, certain apps and certain things aren't, 
they don't work with SS, SSO, right? And if you're not, you know, a super admin, your account is exempt. You got to go in and get, you know, either a backup code or an application specific password or what have you. Have you guys seen like the the overall ticket count for password related things go up because of that? As, because we're so fast, SAS forward, it's not, we're not really integrating with anything legacy like an IMAP account or anything like that. I think we don't have that as much. I think our user base is pretty, pretty tech forward and we're not dealing with a lot of more like, you know, insecure mail applications or something that require application specific passwords or things like that. Um, but we do have a lot more requests related to, I got a new phone or I got a new whatever and I need to reset up MFA and um, going through the steps for that. Like that's, we certainly have more of those. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, we have a few more minutes left, but Blair, I really wanted you to talk a little bit about helping customers roll out an IDP and an automation tool at the same time. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where it's more work like by itself, but nets out way less work, right? I mean, this is something we get a lot. In fact, I went through this exact same or exercise when I brought Better Cloud into my last environment where we were bringing in Better Cloud and Okta at the same time. You know, it really allows you to get that correct security posture from an automation standpoint, right? Whether that's onboarding, offboarding, mid lifecycle management, the whole content scanning, external file exposure piece. Uh, you can get all of that set up at the same time as well as getting the SSO and MFA side of things handled. Um, so from a user base per perspective, we were able to do like one set of training, right? And this is, you know, because they're not really seeing the automation on, on their end of it. So we train them on the MFA, train the HR folks on the new automation steps. And then when the, the light went green and everything went live, we were set up correctly right out of the gate. Um, something that now I'm on this side, I'm watching implementations happen after the fact. It is a lot, not, I won't want to say more work, but it is a significant amount of work to get automation rolled out when you've already got policies and process and systems in place. Um, if those systems were all built at the same time, you know, your, your policies could have followed the ability of automation and vice versa. You're not going to be shoehorning things in or trying to figure out like, oh, we've got this weird policy that we set up because we use some weird tool to get this one thing mm -hmm. set. How do we automate that? Like you'll, you won't have any of those issues. You can just architect the entire like user data lifecycle from the beginning correctly. Um, and then obviously, you know, that goes right into the whole SOCs and SOC2 and CCPA and all the other reasons that we're rolling SSO and MFA and automation out anyways. Um, so they all kind of bleed in together so heavily that yeah, doing it all at the same time is definitely my recommendation. If, if you have to do both, right, do them at the same time for sure. Yeah, and if I guess if you're lucky enough to have the budget for it all up front. <laughs> Money, please! Money. Cool. Well, thank you, Blair, for joining us today. Really appreciated you. your expertise and your, uh, your sharing of your of our common experiences as <laughs> IT people. <laughs> We're all in this together. <laughs> um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Next time, Brian and I will be talking about how we use our IDP in conjunction with Better Cloud, the tool to onboard new employees at Better Cloud. So we hope you'll tune in. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Come back real soon now. <laughs> I am from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs>